Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, thank you all for coming. We have quite a bit to go through here, so uh, looking forward to a Q&A as well. And um, let's get started. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, everyone seeing that just fine? Okay, so I wanted to um, thank the organizers for having me um, and I uh, really appreciate this opportunity. This is a new speech, so it's going to be going through lots of evolutions and you're, you're kind of a guinea pig, so uh, it, it'll be very different when I give this in July um, at the Agile conference, but I, I appreciate the feedback and um, positive, negative, whatever. Um, this next slide is really gonna wake you up. So if everyone wants to pay attention, maybe turn up your volume a little bit because uh, this was really, uh, this is a little different. Okay, thank you very much for indulging me there. I just, uh, actually, I thought of that last night and ended up making it this morning. So um, appreciate it. Um, there is, you know, there is some problems. There are some problems in the Agile world. Um, people talk a lot about this. I, you know, some call it, uh, Ron Jeffries calls it dark scrum. Um, it's dark Agile sometimes. Uh, there's, you know, you see things sometimes in the name of Agile that it's, you know, Agile in name only. Um, lots of stuff has happened over the many decades now that we've all sort of been on this journey. And, you know, we could spend a lot of time talking about those problems. Um, uh, for me, it's kind of a depressing subject and um, I've decided to turn towards the light. Um, that is, what is the joy that comes from agility? Um, so really not focused at all on, on the problems because, you know, we can really get into this. It's, it's, there's even today, people in my company are in a situation with a, with a client of ours where it is very, very dark. Um, they're, they're trying to implement some um, crazy process that's not, nothing to do with Agile. And um, it's kind of scary. We've seen all kinds of frameworks that are imposed on people and uh, a lot of unhappy people um, sort of unhappy about Agile. So again, my focus here is going to be on what got me so excited about agility um, starting back in the late 90s. And um, this is a unfinished cover art for a book I've been writing. I've been working on this for a good four, four plus years. Um, I'm a slow writer. I get a lot of feedback from a lot of people and I, I iterate and iterate and iterate and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite. So it takes a long time, but um, this is supposed to come out sometime in late 2022. Um, that subtitle, not even <clears throat> the potential subtitle, we're, we're playing with different subtitles. So it's, it's a very much a work in progress, but there's definitely over 100 stories in here. Uh, my favorite stories of agility to try to tease out what does it mean to be agile and what is this joy that comes from agility? So return of the adjective, um, having fun with our little Star Wars theme here. Um, what does this mean? Well, I like to say that the definition of agile is not a mystery, right? We don't know if, you know, 
the Mona Lisa is smiling or frowning. It's been a mystery for, for, for ages, right? But the, the definition of Agile is not a mystery. We know that it is not this. It is not the certified ability to sprint, estimate with story points, and attend a stand-up meetings. And I get really annoyed when people say, learn Agile, learn Scrum. You know, sorry, Scrum is not Agile. It's, it's, it's a framework. It's been around since the early 90s. It is not how to be Agile. My book has nothing to do with Scrum. It's about agility. This is not agility. And if you think it is, you're, you're sadly mistaken or you're at a really early part of your journey and you need to skip over this. Um, and Agile enterprise, Agile frameworks have become the de facto standard thing that big corporations have to do. And that's also really not something that Yoda likes or is very Agile. Um, and then there's this, we hear the, this all the time. This is like candy to lots of people but um, some would call it a, a very failed attempt at uh, agility. So <clears throat> agile is an adjective, okay? It's been an adjective before there was a manifesto. It's been an adjective for forever, right? Since, since there were living beings, there was agility. It is not a new concept. People think, especially in the software field, that Agile was invented in 2001 in Salt, at, at, the, at the event you know, in Snowbird. I'm sorry, but if you understand what agility means, it is a word. It is a very important word. It's a wonderful word, and it's an adjective. An Agile dancer, an Agile surgeon, an Agile mind. It is an adjective, right? Hence the title of my movie, Return of the Adjective. Um, marked by a ready ability to move with quick, easy grace or having a quick, resourceful, and adaptable character, right? These words matter. They really matter when it comes to being agile. Okay, I like to look at Venn diagrams. So here's one way to look at agile. It is the product of being both quick, easy, and graceful. Quick, easy, grace. That's one way of looking at it. Another definition that we just saw from Miriam Webster is quick, resourceful, and adaptable. All three, right? Not one. If you're just adaptable, you're not agile because you can adapt very slowly, right? That's not agile. It's got to be quick and adaptable and ideally resourceful. So if you start to really dig into these um, words, you start to get, I think, deeper into what agility means and how you can be agile in your context. Okay, so start minimal and evolve. What did I do when I first started writing a book? I didn't really start writing a book. I started writing stories. Some of you may have remembered a, story, a speech I gave maybe a year ago here, or, or maybe a year and a half ago, but it was a Bay ALN speech. And I, I talked to you about the Oreo cookie thing that happened at the Super Bowl, right? You can still dunk in the dark if you remember that. Um, that was one story I wrote. It was an incredibly agile team at the Oreo cookie company being agile during the Super Bowl. Um, there was a blackout in 2013 at the Super Bowl. It was an unexpected event. And within minutes of it happening, a team had put out an incredible tweet that became like the best commercial of the Super Bowl. It was incredible agility displayed by a team. So the story is all about that. That's one of many stories I started writing. And I would you know, help people understand agility by reading these stories, uh, giving them these stories, studying these stories, talking about these stories, because I think stories are one of the best ways to learn. So what ended up starting out, it's like maybe four stories turned into many, many more stories. And those multiplied into many, many more stories where it's like, oh, shoot, okay, it looks like I'm writing a book now. Um, there were a lot of stories being produced with no quite no organization to them. Um, they certainly were stories about things I cared about, right? I care a lot about safety. You may have heard of make safety a prerequisite um, and some other principles. Uh, so the book started to be this big pile of stories and how do I organize them? What do I do? Um, so I basically started thinking, all right, what could I organize this by? And you know, clearly modern agile was one of the ideas. So principles in modern agile, there's four guiding principles in modern agile. I thought, let me start with those. And so that was, you know, an early idea at how, I, how to sort of organize these things. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized that these, these words in the definition of Agile were 
more important, if you will, to explaining what agility is. That the words in, in modern agile are, are nice and good, but these words, I, were, I was getting drawn closer and closer to these words to sort of understand what, what it means to be agile and really explain it. So, so evolution of what ended up becoming some agile mantras. This is where I have to say, if you've ever done test-driven development for the technical people here, um, when you do test-driven development, you don't know what the design is gonna end up being. You don't, it's not, it's not design up front. You don't design the software up front and then just lay bricks and, and implement it. You literally use a process that leads you somewhere where you don't expect to be. I never expected to write any agile mantras. I never expected to have a book of six agile mantras, didn't expect it. I wrote a bunch of stories. And when I started to have to sort of organize those stories magically and slowly, as you're gonna see, these mantras started to um, develop. So John Wooden had a huge influence on my understanding of Agile. Um, over the years, I've been studying him and definitely in the last four or five years, a lot. Um, I have four or five books on him and um, I, I find him to be fascinating. He, uh, if you don't know who he is, first of all, I'm not even a basketball player. I don't play basketball. I barely ever watch it. And you know, for those who aren't athletes, you know, whenever you talk about athletic people, you sort of might tune out. I, I wouldn't tune out too quickly because you don't have to be an athlete or care about basketball to learn from this genius. He's considered one of the greatest coaches of all time. Certainly one of the greatest coaches uh, of basketball. He was a Hall of Fame basketball player and he was a Hall of Fame coach. Okay, now he coached college basketball. He coached the UCLA Bruins. And there's something called the NCAA championships that happen once a year. Um, and his teams won them year after year after year. They won so many, no, no coach has ever won that. I think in the span of 12 years, they won 10 of them, which is just a, a dominance that you could almost never ever equal. Just incredible. And Coach Wooden would basically help train his players into champions with mantras. He had a lot of mantras. And one of his favorite mantras was this mantra, be quick, but don't hurry. There are a lot of people that will say, you know, agile is not about being quick. And they're right, because agile doesn't equal quick, right? If you think agile equals quick, you miss the boat. That's not agile. However, Agile doesn't mean slow either. As we just saw with those Venn diagrams, in both of those Venn diagrams, the word quick is in there. Quickness is a critical element of agility. You are not Agile if you're not quick. It must be a part of it. What you don't want is to hurry or to rush. Because when you hurry or rush, you make, you make significant mistakes. Mistakes that hurt. Mistakes that lose games. Mistakes that injure customers, mistakes that bring down companies. Uh, you don't wanna hurry or rush. So I like to say that quickness and speed are good. Hurrying and rushing is bad, but we want quickness. We want websites to load quickly. We want customer service to be quick. We wanna get our coffee delivered quickly. We want quickness is important, right? It's an important characteristic and it's a very important characteristic of agility. So be quick, but don't hurry. This is a mantra. Honestly, I think about this every day. I honestly think about this mantra every day. When I'm doing things, I ask myself, am I being quick right now or am I hurrying? And if I'm hurrying, I'm like, yeah, you know what? I am hurrying here. I can be quick. I don't have to hurry. So it's a constant mantra that is helping me to be more agile. Again, just being quick is not going to cut it. Now, there's more to just being quick because what John Wooden taught his players was how to be quick. Turns out that's very interesting because it starts connecting us to some of the other mantras. What Wooden would say is if you want to be quick, you got to be in balance. He would blow his whistle when someone would try to shoot a basket off balance. He'd blow his whistle when you're on defense and you were off balance trying to defend. You had to be in balance. 
he'd literally blow his whistle, right? He was teaching his players to be in balance. A lot of times that meant getting them to slow down. You're going too fast if you're completely out of balance. So slow down a little bit, be in balance. Balance is key to quickness. Then there's the word poised. As we'll see later, to be poised means to, to not hesitate. You're ready. You are ready to do something, being poised. Very, very important word to championship basketball players and I think to aspiring agilists. So the first mantra that entered into this uh, collection of stories was be quick, but don't hurry. And I started to build up more and more stories around what does that mean, right? What, what does it not mean? When, when do team, uh, companies make mistakes do, doing this and are hurrying and rushing and so forth? So lots of stories around that first mantra, be quick, but don't hurry. Now, I'm a big fan of Paul O'Neill. Um, Paul O'Neill, if you don't know him, was the CEO of Alcoa. He went on to become the Treasury Secretary of the United States in 2000. Um, and he then also went on to being a, a major um, innovator in the healthcare industry, bringing safety to healthcare. Um, just a, a genius of a guy. And um, he has these three questions, which are really important for helping to see if a company or a group is capable of what he would call habitual excellence. Habitual excellence, there's these three questions. One of them, the first one, is about are you treated with dignity and respect every day? Are you treated with dignity and respect, right? He believed that if you were not treated with dignity and respect in your company, you had no chance as a company of ever having habitual excellence. I really love that. I've used it in my own company. We've polled people and we've tried to figure this out. Are, we, are you being treated with dignity and respect and asking everybody? Um, and then the other two questions, which I won't get to tonight. Um, so basically, you know, this led to another mantra, which is treat people with dignity and respect. Um, it didn't last that long. Um, it wasn't that the idea wasn't good. It's just that it's a bit wordy. And I started to think about other things. So that word grace, right? There's that word grace. What does that word really mean? Okay, so in my book, I have a section about the definition of, of agile and the definition of these words. So I'll read this. Agility also requires grace, which in this context means ease and suppleness of movement or bearing. Ease and suppleness of movement and bearing. Suppleness associates grace with adaptability, since the word means readily adaptable or responsive to new situations. It's fascinating that grace is connected to being adaptable. So when we are graceful, we are, you know, harmonious. We work, we interact harmoniously with others. We move with ease, we're balanced, relaxed, and able to respond to new situations without hesitation. Now, John Wooden would say, by the way, if you hesitate on the basketball court, you're, you're poised to lose. No hesitation. He, he trained his players to never hesitate, right? Um, so basically this word grace was sticking to me and I'm saying there's got to be something here. And I started to realize, you know what? The real mantra is, is just be graceful. And that was, you know, how that mantra trained. It was be graceful. And I looked at what Paul O'Neill was doing. He was being extremely graceful with people, right? Be graceful. Um, as I said, writing is hard and it takes a while and you can write quickly and not produce something of quality. So that wasn't good enough and I, it didn't last. Be graceful was not enough. There was, there was something else. And the more I was studying Wooden, the more I realized there was something else here. Wooden said this, if you don't have physical balance, you cannot be quick. To have physical balance, it must be preceded by mental balance and emotional balance. If you don't have those, you will be hurrying. Then you will have, and this is one of his favorite phrases, activity without achievement. Activity without achievement, right? If you've ever been involved in a transformation that changed a bunch of things, but nothing got better, that's activity without achievement. Okay, so physical balance require a mental balance and emotional balance to be a championship player. But balance is a key word, and it's not just for basketball. <clears throat> when my daughter Eva learned to ride her bike, she's a third of, of three daughters and my youngest, we switched to this concept of the balance bike. I just said, don't pedal, just balance. And she learned to bike 
much, much, much faster than my other two daughters because she perfected balance really early, right? This father and daughter in, in, the, in the, uh, other part of the picture there was going the traditional way, you know, training wheels, where balance was not taught. You have training wheels, you're not learning balance. Eva learned balance really early, and then she was she was basically pedaling quickly after that. Within two trips to the park, she was riding her bike. Balance is key. And so basically, um, we looked at balance and said, how is balance important in agility across many contexts? One way is uh, we look at meetings. Is there a balance of voices? Right. If you have a typical meeting, do does does only two people say speak the whole time and everybody else is silent? Then you don't have a balance of voices, right? You're not really practicing what we call clear. Um, so this became be balanced and graceful. Okay, that's the mantra: be balanced and graceful. They go together. You have to have balance in order to be graceful. And balance is critical to, to quickness. So it's connected to that be quick, but don't hurry. And that's how that came about. Be balanced and graceful. Next, um, you know, I, I've written a lot about um, the, the, the Gossamer Condor, which is the first human powered airplane. Um, it's, it was an incredible achievement. Um, and it took uh, one team. So for 17 years, there was this, this, this prize called the Kremler Prize. For anyone, any team that could basically create a human powered aircraft that could fly in a figure eight in a, in a one mile radius in a figure eight and land gracefully all under human power. No one cracked it until Paul McCready and team in Southern California finally did it. How did they do it? And if you study McCready and his team closely, you see that they were learning and adapting rapidly very, very rapidly, incredibly fast feedback loops. Why is Chris Rock here? Because Chris Rock, the comedian, when he develops a brand new set, does the exact same thing. He's not building a human powered airplane. He's building a, you know, uh, incredibly awesome comedy set. And he does it in this learning and adapting very rapidly way, right? He's trying out tons and tons of jokes. He's not being his normal, like really amazing uh, cell. He sits on a stool with a, like a legal pad and tries out one joke after another to see if there's any signs of, of laughter. It's very scientific almost. It's not your typical Chris Rock performance when he's first evolving. Um, so learning and adapting rapidly was and is extremely important. In modern agile, there's a principle which is experiment and learn rapidly very focused on experimentation, experimenting and learning rapidly. What you might not know, what you may notice here is none of the words in those Venn diagrams are here, right? And there's no word experiment in the Venn diagrams for Agile, right? There's no word in, even in the Merriam-Webster dictionary, it doesn't talk about experimenting in the Merriam-Webster dictionary definition of the adjective. Experiment or learning, they're good things, but they're not really to me, they're not in the heart of what it means to be Agile. So that changed. We said, Huh, this word adaptable, it really needs to be in there because ultimately we're learning and adapting. We are adapting, you know, it's learning, experimenting. Okay, we're adapting, let's change it. Changed it to learn and adapt rapidly. And that was the mantra for many, 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 many months until it changed. Why did this one change? Nothing wrong with it, it's perfectly fine. I'm like, oh my God, I'm gonna change this again. This is crazy. I'm gonna have to do so many changes to the book. Well. In my studies of resilience engineering, um, these people are brilliant, right? Absolutely brilliant. When you look at resilience and you look at what it takes to be resilient, David Woods, David D. Woods down there, one of the authors, um, is known for a lot of the uh, leading thinking. They're, they're all three of those authors are, absolutely all of them are brilliant. David D. Woods likes to say, be poised to adapt. So what does that mean, poised? And it comes back to a lot of what John Wooden talks about, is poise on the basketball court. You're ready, you're poised. You are not caught off guard. Um, and what Wood says is, or David Wood says is, it's not just adapting on the fly, right? Some of you may have seen the, the uh, Apollo 13 movie. You know when um, there's a problem up there, they have the major problem and they have to figure out how to get like a round um, thing working with the square thing. 
right? To, to keep giving oxygen to the astronauts. Any of you remember that? It's in the movie. And the way they Hollywood makes it seem is that some engineers in NASA suddenly have to go on, you know, on a table, they surround a table, they throw some stuff on the, on the table, which is parts and pieces that are on the spacecraft. And they have to like rapidly right there on the spot, figure out a solution for basically getting something round to work with something square. Well, that's not what happened in real life. Not at all. NASA had practiced this. NASA had practiced and practiced and practiced different things that could go wrong. That was one of them. They were poised to adapt. So it's not just the ability to adapt, it's being poised and ready to adapt. That's pretty, really key here. So this is what we aim for is that we're not caught off guard, we're poised and ready for adapt, adapting. We have an adaptive capacity in the words of David Woods. Our capacity to adapt should be relatively high. If we're hitting the boundary of it, we gotta be careful because we can't adapt anymore. Adaptive capacity, being poised to adapt. So the stories in this section of the book are all about what it means to be poised to adapt. The next one is relatively easy. What is this here? This is evolutionary design. This is evolving, right? We're evolving a guitar. I have a lot of people in my company who are guitar players. Um, someone's son even makes guitars. And uh, I'm told you can play an entire, you can play several, many different songs, even on that guitar on the, on the far left, one string. It's still a guitar. It's an emerging, evolving guitar you can play songs on. Evolutionary design. This happened with the book. And by the way, the reason my name is all over this is it tends to get copied and pirated so much that it's like we, we kind of went over the top and put a lot of branding on it. <laughs> um, start minimal and evolve is that mantra, okay? Start minimal and evolve. It's baked into uh, TDD, test driven development. It's baked into the way I work. Um, I started writing a book by just writing a few valuable stories and then a few more, and then a few more, and then evolved it, and then organized it, and then organized it some more, and it's still evolving to this day. Start minimal and evolve is an absolutely critical uh, mantra. The next one is um, related to safety. So as I said earlier, Paul O'Neill, um, very, very incredible leader in terms of bringing safety to Alcoa and to other industries. Right? It wasn't just about, so if you're going to respect people, right? if you're going to give them dignity and respect, hopefully you're not like having them go home with scars or, or you know, broken limbs or, or death. Um, you have to protect them. You have to protect your people. So safety, absolutely critical. What Paul O'Neill did was he changed a 100-year-old, you know, old-fashioned company, an aluminum company. He wasn't an aluminum guy and didn't know anything about aluminum, came in there and transformed the company through safety. It was an unbelievable transformation. Um, if you ever read The Power of Habit, there's an entire chapter devoted to Paul O'Neill in there. And safety was critical in that, in that transformation. Safety is also critical to psychological safety, right? It's part of uh, the, the big move to make teams more psychologically safe, right? This is a buzzword at this point. However, if you dig deep into it, it's extremely important. It's a wonderful um, habit to learn and uh, technique, uh, learning all the different ways to create psychological safety. It's very difficult to do, but it's very rewarding. So that's another element of safety. So it would have been obvious to have a mantra called make safety a prerequisite. That's another modern agile principle. Um, and that was the that was the the pop mantra for a while until I started to realize you know what there's there's something slightly off about it and um, it wasn't that it's a bad idea it's a great idea to make safety prerequisite right it's incredibly important but for example these these books here the fearless trilogy um, Amy's book is one of them we have uh, Mary Lynn Manns and, and Linda Rising's fantastic book, Fearless Change, and they have a, a Fearless Change 2 book as well. And then this other book on the left, Driving Fear Out of the Workplace, is another favorite of mine. I call it the Fearless Trilogy. Um, and this fearlessness is such an important thing that it got me thinking, maybe we should listen to Dr. Deming. And you know, when I think about even Eva learning to ride her bike, she's so low to the ground, her feet can touch at any time. She's not afraid. There's no fear. 
right? There's a terrible fear when you take your, your, uh, the wheels off the, the, you know, the, but there's no fear when you're just doing a balance bike because you're just balanced, right? The training wheels come off, you are afraid. Drive out fear. Drive out fear is basically W. Edwards Deming's, uh, you know, sort of mantra to management. The manager's job or the leader's job is to drive out fear. So that is this next mantra, drive out fear. That's what we need to do. Finally, um, or actually not finally, we got, we got uh, yeah, finally, this is the last one. Um, Richard Branson, this is a fantastic book. If you've never read this book, highly, highly, highly recommend it. In this book is a wonderful story of when Richard Branson was, uh, it was in the late 1970s. He was in the British Virgin Islands waiting to catch a flight to Puerto Rico with a bunch of other passengers. And the, the airline basically, it was a clear blue skies, no, no, no problems with weather. And the airline says the flight's canceled. We don't know when the, when the new flight's coming. Now, most people would be like, oh my God, what are we gonna do? Go, go, you know, go to a restaurant, go drink some coffee or beer, whatever it was, wait for, wait for the plane, wait, be passively waiting. What Richard did was a little different. Richard said, I'm gonna call a charter airline. See if we can get a flight. <laughs> so he calls the charter airline, finds out, yes, they can get a flight. He does the math, turns out it's $39 per seat. He goes all around the airport recruiting people to fly with him, other fellow passengers, fills the plane, everyone paying $39, and flies uneventfully to Puerto Rico. He is resourceful. And so be resourceful was the final mantra made to be resourceful. And of course, that's in the, those Venn diagrams earlier, right? Quick, adaptable, resourceful, yeah? Almost went with this name, but decided not to because it uh, looks like I left out an R as well, so apologies. Um, I decided that uh, that wasn't enough. There was something missing. What was missing? Well, there's that concept of quick and there's the concept of easy, right? Easy. We haven't used the word easy much in these mantra names. You haven't seen it much. If you look at the word readily, this comes up uh, when you're looking at some of these definitions, right? Readily, without hesitating. When I read that readily means without hesitating, I'm thinking, who am I thinking about? John Wooden. I'm thinking about his basketball players. I'm thinking about them not hesitating on the basketball court. And I'm realizing people that are very, very agile, they don't hesitate. Richard Branson didn't hesitate to find a solution to the plane problem, right? Without hesitating, he decided I'm gonna call a charter airline company. So I added the word and um, another way of looking at this, suppleness associates grace with adaptability since the word means readily adaptable, right? You're not hesitating to be adaptable. You're not hesitating to be resourceful. So this became be readily resourceful. And those are the six mantras that are in the book. And there's um, well over 100 stories that basically um, help, to un help to sort of explain the different aspects of these mantras. There's many different aspects of them to really understand how you might implement them. So the stories are all about helping you to understand why are these mantras important and what do they really mean and what do they not mean and how could you use them to be more and more agile. And that was an unexpected development in writing the book. I did not write a table of contents with any of these mantras in it when I first started. I don't ever write table of contents when I start a book. It evolves. It evolves from, from one or two pages to you know, a whole book. Um, I like to say we want to break on through to the agile side. I think Jim Morrison meant to say this instead of the other side, but he's dead, so we can't really ask him. Um, and if you're very interested in the book, you can go to industriallogic.com slash joy dash of dash agility, uh, and you can learn more there. We have, um, we have an email list and you can join it. We don't spam anyone, but we do announce webinars and talks and other events. Um, thank you. Thank you all for listening. I know that was that went on a little while and uh, happy to do some Q&A. Let's take a very quick pause so Josh can have a glass of water and I lunch quick poll. If you guys can please take uh, 
a quick poll and answer two basic questions to help us learn and do better programming would be great. And then we're going to move in a Q&A. Elena, a quick question. Sure. Uh, do you just toss out those people that say five stars and three stars on the on those <laughs> polls? Because how valuable is it to actually? I, I just did that unconsciously because it's true, but also how valuable is it to get feedback that's just keep doing what you're doing? If you want to elaborate on your stars, just put in the chat and we'll be paying close attention. Thanks. Yeah, also you feel free to email me too if you wanted to send me some more detailed feedback. Happy to get your feedback on joshua at industriallogic.com or just josh at industriallogic.com works as well. The, what, what we what we are learning with this poll is, uh, you know, like what do you really think of how much you value our uh, meetup that we put so much work in? And uh, what is your take on this uh, particular event? How much of a value that brought to you is not on the Josh's, con Josh's content. For content, he has his Q&A and um, we're moving right into that time. Okay, yeah, maybe I got that off. So thanks for the, the clarification, Elena. Yeah. He can answer all your questions. Well, all I right. think, yeah, good <clears throat> enough for that. Thank you, guys. And um... For the Q&A, I want to suggest that we'll use the raise hand feature that is part of the reactions at the bottom uh, of, your, of your Zoom window. Um, so we can, we can go off mute and we don't um, <clears throat> talk over each other. Edward, were you just practicing with it? <laughs> with no, I, I, I do have a question. Uh, Joshua, um, I really love the presentation. I'm My brain is kind of awash with thinking about how, where are the aspects of cultural transformation we can do uh, when it comes to, when it's not the individual team that we're working with. So my question is, and, and it was earlier mentioned customer service, how do you pass down being readily resourceful to teams that are more at the L2, L1 level for, for support or th those that need to be able to, to provide an excellent experience, um, but may not, uh, the way that they are currently structured and the way that they're contracted and so on and so forth can present challenges. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's always, uh, there's always obstacles, there's always challenges. The joy, when, we, when I talk about the joy of agility, it's, it's how do you sort of get around those things? How do you break through to the agile side, right? So um, a, a lot of what I like to do is focus in on stories and examples of where, you know, groups were able to do that. Or somehow, like uh, there's a story about um, a woman at Nordstrom's who was able to provide incredible customer service uh, because of a mistake that was made. And uh, what enabled that? You know, how did Nordstrom's culture provide an ability for that person to do what they did? Turns out they were quite empowered to be resourceful. Okay, so if people aren't empowered to be resourceful, then, then how can you make that happen, right? What, what is preventing it from happening? Maybe it's leadership not being aware of how people lack the ability to be resourceful. Maybe it's people not understanding what they are empowered to do, even though leadership thinks they can do it, right? Leadership may think I'm, I'm empowered, but in fact, they're not. Um, so a lot of you know, uh, obstacles like that have to be, you have to shine a light on them, make them really clear what the problem is, get people talking to each other, especially at the very top of the organization and the bottom of the organization uh, to, to really break through to the agile side. Oh, um, Joshua, 
This is Smita. Smita, sorry, we have a question from Jubin. Jubin uh, raised his hand but was waiting for a while. Let's have Jubin go, sir. Thank you. Thank you. A great presentation, Josh. I appreciate it. Quick question Thank here. You. Like being able to give that psychological safety or even for allowing people to be graceful when we have different personalities across the organization and nobody's willing to kind of toe that line. How do you kind of deal with that? Do you go few people at a time or go broad? How, how would you recommend that to happen? I mean, one of the ways we like to start is in meetings, is just in meetings. Like, can we at least, even when we have meetings, have those be psychologically safe? It's a, it's a, it's a decent place to start out where, again, people don't interrupt each other. People are, have an have a ability to speak. They're encouraged to speak. You keep track of who's speaking, who's not. Um, so that, that's a starting place. From there, you know, I, I think it helps to, I love study groups, you know, I love uh, reading groups. So, you know, you might, you might get Amy Edmondson's book on, on the fearless organization and read it together and discuss it and look for ways to improve that way. There are courses that are taught in psychological safety. There's a scan. There's a scan that Amy Edmondson's fearless organization provides, which helps to identify it. So it's literally a bunch of questions that, that, you know, people in the company get to answer. And from it all, you can rate how psychologically safe the environment is. Um, some of our people in industrial logic could do that scan, right? So they've been certified by that organization to do the scan. They've done the scan within industrial logic. They've done it at our clients. Um, so the scan also provides a sort of beginning of where are we good maybe, and where do we need to improve in our psychological safety? So there, there's a lot of resources for, you know, for making progress on it these days. Right, thank you. Sure. Go ahead, Smita. Thank you. Um, I was just curious when the book is going to be released. This is your second one. Is that the oh, yeah, great question. I mean, um, I you know, would love the book to come out this summer. Um, I, I don't know exactly when they'll actually get it completely finalized. Um, so it's... Um, you know, it goes through various stages, right? Right now, it's towards the tail end of a developmental edit. Um, it, it's a I have a very good publisher. I'm uh, very happy with this publisher. Um, and they, you know, some publishers, you give them a manuscript, they take it, they don't do much with it, and they publish it. Um, mm -hmm. This publisher, you go through a developmental edit portion where someone reads over the books at least once and gets deep thoughts about what they might need to change. And then uh, you work with that developmental editor to make some improvements. So we're almost at the tail end of that. And then it goes into like, you know, it'll, so it will be, you'll, you'll be able to order it on Amazon. Um, I hope by the spring, but it won't actually be out in physical print. I don't know, summer or, or fall, you know, that's, that's most likely. Is there going to be an audible version of it? Yes, there will be a, an audio version of the book. Yes. But you are going to read the book, right? Are you the one who's going to? Um, I I would like to do that. I'm told it's really difficult work, but um, I'm, <laughs> yes. kind of to, I'm used to difficult work, so I'm going to try and see if I can do it. Yes, my, my intention is to be the one reading it. Thank you. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. I'll call Eric next. Hey, Joshua. I really like the... Uh the John Wooden stuff. And I, I, I read Andrew Hill's book, uh, Be Quick, But Don't Hurry, uh, many, many years ago. It made a big impact on me. And I have a, a question coming out of that uh, for you. Did, did you go down the uh, path of looking at the pyramid of success uh, from John Wooden uh, when you were thinking through the Agile Mantra stuff? And if so, how did it affect your uh, thinking? There's so many parts and pieces to the pyramid of success um, that I, I frankly did not um, look at that because I just found it's, it's, there's just a lot there. Um, it's, it's got, I don't know how many parts of the pyramid, but there's, there's yeah, a, lot. a dozen. Yeah, a dozen. So um, no, I didn't, I didn't study the pyramid of success too closely um, with that because really, I mean, I was looking at agility itself, just, just agility. Um, which, you know, is a portion of being successful. It may not be all you need to be successful, 
Uh, I think the pyramid of success has even more than, than just what agility is. Uh, yes. I really wanted to write like a definitive guide for agility. Um, and that's, that's really what I, what I focused on. There's so many, there's so many books about agile, but I wanted to write a definitive guide to just what is this thing and how could you be agile in your context? It's, it's, this book is not a software book, by the way. There's lots of stories about my daughter's learning to ride or, um, or bikes or plumbing situations. I've had it at the house or all kinds of crazy stories of, of agility in many parts of my life. And then lots of other people's stories that I feel exemplify um, agility or the lack thereof. Well, the John Wynn stuff really resonated and I, I do love the agility in parenting as well. <laughs> yeah, very cool. Yeah, I'm a, a fellow John Wynn nerd, so. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Eric. I have uh, Alexander next, Alexander Kisner. And I also want to quickly answer, because uh, I cannot, uh, since I'm still recording, I cannot answer uh, messages. The Everyone who's registered for the event would e receive an email with the link to recording. So it's always going to happen for you. Don't worry. Alexander, go, go ahead. You're muted, muted. Guilty, sorry, habit. Um, Josh, I love it and it's a resonate of my few, few weeks ago, I was, I was chatting with Alan Holub. He was continuing his journey and that of Agile and it touches so many points, but he's more grounded on the software development. Your focus is more on organizational changes, the way the, organization set up. And my question is actually posted, everything hinge on the leadership, right? We need, before we actually start talking about the quickness, adaptability, graceness, right? We need to have agreement from the rank uh, about the wording. And you actually putting that it's a lot of slides. What does it mean to be agile, to other stuff? and to understand what's agile, what's scrum, what Kanban, what's safe, right? Uh, and also agree on that rules. But how can you bring the top players into the game? How can you put that definition of ready, the readiness, right? To start, we need to understand what ready means, right? Not just be ready. And this conversation with most of my failures, I'm just saying that to myself, uh, I'm failing to engage them. They expecting their expectation, not what they, they don't know what they're asking for. Their definition is right, is different. And my question is, how can you bring that into the engagement? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot, a lot requires practice. You've got to practice. You've got to practice if you're going to be good at anything. Um, so, I think that we have to practice being agile. We have to practice being poised to adapt, right? We have to be ready to, to, to adapt. We have to you know, practice our resourcefulness. Um, we have to practice. And I don't think we practice enough. If you looked at John Wooden's teams, they said that they, they practiced so much and they, they, they basically would do something quick and then Coach Wooden would say, I want it quicker. And they endeavor to be quicker. And he'd say, I want it even quicker. They would say that the players would say that when we actually played a basketball game, it was slower. Everything seemed slow compared to practice. And John Wooden would say, I'm more of a practice coach than a you know, live game coach. The games, you know, what's going to happen is going to happen based upon the practice that the players had. Um, right now, that, that's his focus, that practice. I don't think we practice enough. I don't think we practice how to be agile enough. And we somehow think we're professionals because maybe we took a course and then came back and now we're back to work, right? So to me, really, if you want to get good at this, it's, it's about practicing and being deliberate about um, these mantras. I, I, you know, I find I, I did not create many of the mantra names. I didn't, I, I didn't invent drive out fear. I didn't invent be quick, but don't hurry. But I, I'm now finding them to be extremely value valuable to to figuring out what needs to happen you know can we retrospect and find out we were rushing great okay we got to be quick and not rush not hurry 
there is that mantra again. Um, and so to me, you know, there, there needs to be a target that's more than just, am I doing what it says to do in the framework? I'd rather have, am I living the mantra, right? That's what I'd rather teams be doing, right? At the team level, organization level. Uh, again, the book is written for anyone who wants to be agile. It's not for any given industry. This is an industry free book, right? It's for any industry. You could be a surgeon and read the book. Um, but I think those mantras really point to point the right direction for what it means to be agile and how to become agile. Thank you. And uh, I cannot disagree with you and continue and again, keep working. Yeah. But at the same yeah. time, as you mentioning agility, agile, and, and bring the example from the uh, basketball, let's not forget that uh, it's a tangible and non-tangible things we do, right? If just happen to be, I am in the engineering side, I am with the ITs and concept of tangible assets, right? Tangible thing as driving the bicycle, uh, as playing basketball and intangible, the approaches are different. Some of the stuff may need to be changed. Exactly, but the, the, the goal is the same. It's always like, if I, if I don't know what I'm building, I don't know what the customers want, there's a fog of uncertainty. The quicker that I can figure that out, the better, right? I wanna be very quick in terms of how I validate well, my, my experiments and how I learn as rapidly as possible, right? So it's a different game. Yes, it's not a, it's not a simple game as basketball and you know, you know, you either win or lose in the basketball game, right? It's different. I find, you know, that I've been doing this for a very long time. So to me, the common denominators are now super clear. I don't like question them anymore. I don't say, well, these mantras don't apply to this industry because I see them applying. They're just different, right? I was writing the book. Uh, I'm using all those mantras as I'm writing the book, right? I'm adapting constantly, you know, poised to adapt. I'm ready, I'm open-minded. I'm like, yeah, give me feedback, I'll adapt it, right? Um, I'm, I'm being as quick as I can in terms of uh, making the changes, right? It can take a couple of years or more to write a book, right? So it takes a while still, you're going for something important, but your process, what you're doing is as quick as it can be without hurrying. All those mantras, you know, apply, right? Uh, can I reach out to Amy Edmondson and get a quote? Can I be resourceful and get a testimonial from her? Yeah, it turns out I could. Uh, it's that writing a book different from playing basketball, different from writing software. I'm finding that those mantras are pretty solid for different endeavors. And let's not forget, it's required mindset. Thank you. Yes, Thank you. Sure. Uh, I want to ask, uh, next question was coming from Ken Roberts, though he didn't uh, raise the hand, he put it in the chat box. Ken, you want to ask the question? And after that, going to be Claudio. Sure, why not? Um, even though I'm asking you to choose one of probably many conceptual children on your part, um, is there a particular story in the book that you like to relate the most and what is it? Um, it, it may be the John Wooden story because it brings in way more than just be quick, but don't hurry. Um, you know, I have um, some quotes from some of his players in that story. Each story is only like two or three pages long or less. Um, but that story really speaks to me because it talks about that balance, how important balance is. And when he talks about emotional and mental balance, I mean, this is a basketball player talking about emotional balance. He's like, if you've had problems in your life and you come to the basketball court, you're not gonna be a champion, right? So you're, you're imbalanced, there's imbalances. Uh, so it brings in that concept of balance. It, it brings in, of course, be quick, but don't hurry. Um, to me, it, it, he talks about adaptability, adapting on the fly and not hesitating. So being very, very resourceful on, in the basketball court. Um, driving out fear, I, I mean, I, I think um, that's, that's part of the practice that they did. They practice and practice and practice made it so that they weren't afraid when they, they played their game. So I just see a lot of the mantras in that one story. Um, but there are some others that I, I also love too. I, I, there's a story about the Wright brothers. Uh, I think I studied four different books on the Wright brothers. I love the Wright brothers. I love learning about them. And to me, they're, they're exemplars of agility. Um, 
and they were doing their stuff back in the 1890s and you know early part of the you know the 20th century, um, way before the manifesto. Again, don't don't think agile is the manifesto. Um, they were extraordinarily agile to invent the airplane. So, yeah, um, those two stand out a lot. Probably forgetting others, but there's there's over a hundred stories. So um, everyone has their favorites. Awesome, thank you. Thank you, Claudio. You're next. Um, hi, Josh. Um, very excited about the book. Um, many years ago, when I met you, you uh, introducer, you suggest that there's a concept like um, the preconditions for agility. Like it's not everyone or every company is ready is ready for that. Um, can you explain like how do you see that concept these days, and um, if and how your view of these preconditions uh, changed over time? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, over time, I'm, I'm, I'm finding that um, I, I, I look at a lot of companies trying to become agile um, or trying to leverage concepts of agility. And they start off with teams that are not balanced teams, right? This is another, you know, thing that occurred to me throughout when writing the book is I'd always, I'd heard the term balanced team. And I, I was like, well, it's not a cross-functional team. And I'm like, yeah, it is, but, you know, it's in balance. It has the right balance of people. So a balanced team. I find that a lot of companies don't even start off with a balanced team. So they're starting off a project, you know, hoping to be agile. They don't even have the people on the, on the project. So they're not a balanced team. So, you know, that's a prerequisite to me for, for being agile is you gotta have the right people. Uh, whether they're involved full-time or part-time, you know, we don't know, but they, they can't be like on four different initiatives where 25% of their time they're on this and that, and they're constantly like, you know, just uh, task switching. So that's a basic one, for example, of, of a precondition. You know, other ones are just, can they, um, can they, how hard is it to get ideas out, right? If we're talking about software development, right? Then how, how soon does it take, does it, how quickly can I get something into production, even if it's hello world, right? So what kind of de deployment pipeline would allow for that? Um, what, how many management chains do I have to go through to make a decision? Can I say no? Can the product management of the team say no when more and more requests come in to put this and that and the other thing into the, the product, right? Further delaying value that you can give out to customers. So that there's, it's not like a single one like answer of what are the prerequisites for any given team because it depends on the context. But in general, there are some just basics, right? Even on a basketball team, if you don't have, you don't have the right players, you're not gonna be successful. Uh, so any team has to have the right players. They have to have a kind of a focus and a clarity on what they're trying to achieve. They cannot be vague about, you know, you may not know how to achieve it, but you might know we want to be number one uh, for uh, some category or, you know, at the top of the list of top brands for X, you know, so you have a very clear goal. Um, so having clear goal, having the right people, uh, a lot of this comes down to the chartering practice, which is where you get super clear on what you're trying to achieve, who's going to help you achieve it, how you're going to work together, and those types of things. So chartering tends to tease out a lot of the prerequisites. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Claudio. Nice to see you. Any other questions, Kamal? Go ahead, Kamal. Thanks, Alina. <clears throat> hi, Joshua. Hi, Kamal. Um, hi. Uh, question for you is around performance reviews, basically. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what I've actually observed is in, in many companies, the whole practice is just burning down anything that's closer to agility if the performance review is the archaic traditional means. So what are your thoughts about, you know, uh, changing that or moving to a newer world around perf? Performance. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, I, I, I turn back to um, a lot of those, those three questions that Paul O'Neill asks. Um, and we didn't get to the two others. We only looked at one of them. Um, but if you search for, you know, Paul O'Neill's three questions for habitual excellence, I've written a blog about it and there's others. Um, one of his questions is about, are people getting the kind of tools and education that they need um, in order to make a meaningful contribution to their life. In, order, in other words, that the job is something that makes a meaningful contribution to their life. Um, so he, uh, again, what Paul O'Neill is doing is, is 
incredible respect and dignity that he's giving to people. And everyone has that in the organization. You know, the, those keys for habitual excellence to me is where the focus needs to be. Not so much on like, hey, you know, you did this or you did that wrong or you did this wrong. Um, you know, I do, I do. So I probably differ from some people. Um, to me, I'd love to have a coach wooden over my shoulder with a whistle, blowing his whistle when I, when I mess up on something. Like, you know, when, I, when I'm hurrying and, you know, he would do this. He would blow the whistle on players when they were out of balance, when they were hurrying, when they were doing whatever things didn't really match what, they were, what their values were. Um, you know, so I think some regular, you know, kind of kind candor, if you will, I think kind candor is the radical candor book and kind candor concept is very important to be able to, to help each other to, you know, figure out what's not going so well, what can be improved. But that's to me a more of a continuous thing. I think feedback has to be continuous and gentle and kind and not once a year. Once a year is just, it's like the old fashioned day. It's very coarse grained. You know, we want fine grained so we can adapt and adjust. We can be poised to adapt if we're getting feedback more regularly. We're understanding what's not working or what is working more regularly. If I have a problem with someone, I don't let it fester. I really don't. I might sleep on it, but the next day I'm going to bring it up. Um, I'm not hesitating because I find the longer you hesitate, the longer it, it, you don't deal with it, the worse it becomes. You've got to, you know, so to me, that's feedback. It's maybe mutual feedback, but it's, it's fine grained. So to me, that's important too. Fine grained feedback, fine grained candor and kindness. I think a lot of smart companies are studying what kind candor is. You know, they're taking courses in it and they're learning how to give each other careful and kind uh, feedback. Anyone else? Tamita, do you have a new question? All right, cool. Thank you very much, Joshua. Thank, thank you, think, thank you, Volker. Thank, thank you, yes. I think thank from you. here, yeah. yeah. Um, I want to invite us into some breakout groups and take some of these mantras into conversations with each other. And Gosh, thank you. Relates to each other, sort of how, what this, where this resonates in our work and in our lives and um, share some of our own stories as they relate to